Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain through the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Perhaps you heard that passage just read and you were thinking, this all sounds a bit crazy. Maybe you're thinking it sounds a bit sexist. The head of a wife is her husband, wearing head coverings. I'm conscious as we think about these issues this morning, issues of gender, We're dealing with a subject that we've all got a stake in. We're working in through our series in 1 Corinthians, and this is where we've got to. Our verses this morning are challenging, both to understand and to apply. But it's our conviction here that God's word is good for us, that it brings life, that it brings light. And so we prayerfully ask him to help us to understand and to respond. And I hope what we'll see this morning in these verses is the big thing is that God is calling for our life together as men and women in the church to be full of honor, to be full of honor and interdependent flourishing as we build his church together. How we behave really matters because the church really matters to God. So where are we in this letter? Well, we're in Corinth, the church Uh, in Corinth. It's a church that's taken on worldly values. It's a place concerned with self-advancement, seeking status in the world, accommodating to the world, pushing others down. It's a church that's behaving more like an episode of The Apprentice than is displaying the gospel there to believe. And so Paul has been calling them away from self-promotion, trying to secure status in the world, to self-sacrificial service, to build up the church for a secure eternity. Look back at 10 verse 33, just before our passage. Paul says, just as I try to please everyone in anything, in everything, I do not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so in chapters 11 to 14, as we work through, we're going to see how the church is to use its gifts in an ordered way to relate to one another in love and service as God has designed it. And the first issue is how do men and women relate together? And we begin by looking at this scene in chapter 11. I'll read verse 4 and 5 to us to give us a sense of it. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's the same as if her head were shaven. So the setting is a church meeting. And the question is, how are men and women to present themselves, head covered or uncovered, when they're praying and when they're prophesying? Now in the coming weeks, we're going to think a bit more about what prophecy is, but it will help to have a bit of a 
kind of working definition now as we look at this passage. There'll be different views among Bible-believing Christians about what prophecy in 1 Corinthians refers to. And there'll be different views among us this morning, I imagine. But let me point to a few key verses to help us to get some sense of it. 14 verse 3, just over the page. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. So prophecy is something that builds up. It's something that will encourage those who hear it. It's something that will console those who hear it. And then later in chapter 14, we're told it may also convict the unbeliever of sin. It may say to someone, you need to turn to Jesus. It's separate from the authoritative teaching in the church, but given its effects, it seems to have a gospel content expressed and applied in different ways. So it might be a bit like what's happening in our small groups in Central Focus, in IGD, as we discuss and we share insights and applications of the gospel. It might be hearing from a mission partner or an interview that applies the gospel. Or even gospel applied in discussions in our church council. It's that kind of world. And just if you put it like that, it's worth saying there's a lot of prophecy going on in St. Helens if we think of it in those terms. And this passage is really clear that both men and women should be doing it. But there is a way we must do it. We must honour the God-given differences between men and women and that is so that we will flourish in an interdependent working together for the building up of the church. And Paul says to do this, we need to understand headship. So you see that in verse two. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand, it's the same word he's been using all through the letter about knowing. Do you not know? I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. We'll spend a fair bit of time on this point. There's a little bit of heavy lifting to do, and then the the further points will will move a bit more quickly. And verse 3 here is describing an order in the relationships God has made, an order that is good. Imagine one of the building sites in the city around us, and there was no order in the relationships there. No order in the relationships between the workers. They just decide for themselves how to relate. And worse still, they do it in a way that just promotes their own interests. So the concrete guy pours the concrete and it sets overnight. And then the pneumatic drill guy wants to show off his skills and he goes at the concrete. And what do we get? Do we get a building? More like destruction. God has built order into our relationships and he's revealed it to us. And it includes our relationships as men and women. How gracious for our maker to reveal to us how to relate in his world. The wife is the head of the husband. And that phrase is set in the broader context of two other relationships to help us understand it. So you see in verse 3, the wife is the head of her husband. The head of every man is Christ. And the head of Christ is God. There's this order of relationships Headship. But what kind of order is it? What does that mean? Well, we do need to understand what this word head means. Now, a lot of the time, the word head, the Greek word that's being translated, means head, like head, shoulders, knees, and toes. <laughs> Has that ever been sung from here before? <laughs> um, but the English word, like the English word, the Greek word has metaphorical meaning as well. By far the most common meaning is the idea of authority or leadership. And I want us to see that that is the way the Bible uses the word, and that in the Bible it doesn't have to mean harshness or superiority. And that's really important. So two examples, in Ephesians chapter one, we read that God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. So Jesus has authority over all creation, and he's described as head. And then we get it again in Ephesians 5. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself a saviour. Colossians 1 says the same. And we see there that parallel between husband and wife, Jesus and church, an authority relationship 
but one that's characterized by love and self-sacrifice. Those who've done the word studies on all kinds of Greek literature time and again say that the best understanding of this word is authority or leadership. But in 2022, I think this language could make us nervous. We're conscious of tragic abuses of authority. We're conscious of abuse of women by men. So the idea of authority can give us concern. But the Bible never condones violence or abuse of women or coercive, or coercive behavior. It condemns them. And it shows us that authority does not need to be harsh. It doesn't need to be selfish. And that's where the other two relationships in verse 3 are really important. The head of every man is Christ. Just think about that relationship. Jesus is Lord. Yet his pattern of authority is to lay down his life in sacrificial, loving service to serve his church. That's the model that Ephesians 5 gives to husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then we also read the head of Christ is God. And that is speaking about Jesus in his relationship with God the Father as they relate in the Trinity. Think of Jesus' willing submission to his Father's will, even to the cross, for the purpose of salvation. As one writer puts it, Christ shows us in his relationship to the Father how authority structures can function in a godly, love-based fulfillment of roles of leadership and authority and roles of voluntary submission. And it's the same in marriage too. Submission of a wife to husband is always to be voluntary, never coerced. So authority can be exercised in love and in sacrificial service. The other reason we might be nervous of the idea, though, is because we think it suggests superiority and inferiority. But that really isn't the case. We know that from just life examples at school. Teachers may have authority, but we don't think we're less valuable than, do we? They typically have a particular role in that setting. And again, verse 3 shows us the head of Christ is God. Is Jesus inferior to the Father? Of course not. They're utterly equal in essence. Fully God, but different roles. That's the principle that God shows us himself. The author, Claire Smith, puts it this way in her helpful book, God's Good Design. She says, There's an assumption that you cannot have differentiation and hierarchy without also having inferiority and superiority of dignity and worth. But you can. And this is what we find here and elsewhere in the Bible. There's a sameness and equality alongside hierarchy and authority. The head of a wife is her husband. There's order, there's equality, and there's difference in the relational roles. So that's heads, that's authority. But is this talking about just husbands and wives, or is it talking about men and women more broadly? And this question is relevant to how we apply the passage. It matters because we don't want to overreach and go beyond Scripture here. But we also don't want to deny something that might be there. So the words husband and wife in verse 3, you can see from your footnote, also mean man and woman. And the footnote says that really it's context that determines how we translate them. And so I've really wrestled with this in preparation, and there are arguments that go both ways. And as I've read and chatted to people on this, well, this is where I've got to. The Bible is clear that in marriage, the husband is to lead his wife, head of his wife, leadership expressed in self-sacrificial love. But as we go on to verse 7, 8, 9, and 10, Paul roots what he's saying in Genesis 2, which we had read to us. And Genesis 2.18 sets up a pattern. So it says, The Lord said, It was not good for that man should be alone. I'll make a helper fit for him. And so there's a general pattern that men and women are created to work together in complementary ways in the commission to rule God's world. And again, it's worth saying the idea of helper and complement is not a demeaning one. Doctors are helpers. They're not less valuable than patients. And God is a helper. 
Isaiah 41, God says to his people, I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. And that doesn't make him less valuable. So a woman was made as the perfect helper for man to work in God's world. And Genesis 2 states this generally and then shows it has particular expression in marriage. So where does that leave us? Well, I think we're right to take this passage as the ESV does in talking about husbands and wives. But given that Genesis 2 background, we should in some way acknowledge that the general creation pattern that men and women are created with a complementarity, should be, we should seek to recognize that as we relate to one another in the church. What that doesn't mean is that all women should submit to all men. Not at all. That is for marriage. Rather, I wonder if it means as we gather, we're thinking through and we're, want, we're desiring to honor the differences that God has made in us. So that's the heavy lifting. Let's turn to verses four to six to see this. We need to understand headship. So point two, well, so that our gatherings are full of honor. So that our gatherings are full of honor. The presenting issue here is whether the head is covered or not. But the point is about embracing God's created order so that our life together flows, that it hums, that there's honor, not shame. I was cycling up Mile End Road recently and I could hear a squeaky rattling noise. I was wondering if it was my bike, but there was another bike riding along, a rusty bike. It didn't look easy to ride it. Well, this is about avoiding being a church family full of friction like the rusty bike chain and instead lining up with God's created order so that we hum like a well-oiled one, that we can work in unity to build the church. So men, verse four, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Well, what might this covering be? It might be long hair. It might be a material covering of some kind. And wearing it when praying or prophesying dishonors Jesus Christ. Well, why? Well, it might be that because covered heads were common in some pagan temples, then imitating that practice dishonors Jesus. But I wonder if given Paul's focus on male and female, on gender differences, and his desire they're honored, well, I wonder if this is a symbol that somehow suggests an unwillingness for a husband or a man in the church to fulfill his God-given responsibility. If you like, something that's saying, me first, my concerns, not an attitude of service. Abdicating the call to love his wife self-sacrificially, to ensure that she's flourishing in the gathering. Well, what about women? Verse five, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's the same as if her head was shaven. And again, the covering in view here could be long hair being worn up, or it could be a headscarf or a veil of some kind. To wear hair down in Corinth would have been a signal of sexual availability. To have a covering was a sign of modesty. So to be praying or prophesying in a church with hair down or with no hair covering, well, it would bring shame on the husband, not just in the church, but in society. As if saying, well, I'm turning away from him as my head. I'm making much of myself. I'm flaunting myself. Self-promotion that brings shame. And verse six seems to drive home that issue. Verse six, for if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it's disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. It's a kind of slightly circular argument, but the shaved head had connotations of sexual immodesty or adultery. And so the logic goes, well, if you won't wear a head covering, shave your head. But seeing as that's equally shameful, then to honor your husband, wear a head covering. But does this mean to honor one another in the church today, to acknowledge our God-given roles, we need to wear head coverings? Well, I think if your conscience constrains you to do so, as you are seeking to honor your spiritual head, then you should not go against your conscience. It's a wonderful thing to be seeking to honor others. 
But I think here in these verses, this is a place where the instruction is particularly culturally specific to Corinth then. And it's a principle that we need to then think through in our culture today, how to apply it. Is there a similar visible cultural symbol available to us in London in 2022? I'm not sure that there really is. It could be taking a husband's surname when getting married. For some, that might be a particular way of honoring one's husband in British culture. But there are enough cultures here for that not to be the case in many cultures. I wonder if today it's particularly expressed in an attitude or a posture, in the words we say and the way we act. So for husbands, how is our behavior and our speech towards our wives? Does it honor our head? Does it honor Jesus? Are we making the effort to lead, to take the initiative in loving sacrifice, to make it easy and joyful for them to engage in the life of the church? And more widely than in marriage, well, how might this look? We had a time um, with central focus leaders back in March thinking about how we encourage one another to pray uh, after Bible studies. Well, perhaps it looks like stepping up to support that habit of prayer in IGG and central focus or being willing to serve so discussions flow, conscious to ensure the voices of women are heard. There are things that I've seen men in this congregation wonderfully seek to do. There'll be many other ways we could work it through. And wives, I think this looks like a posture of speech which encourages and respects husband's headship as we gather in the church. And perhaps more generally, women avoiding the attitude that says, me first, being unwilling to give space for men in the church to lead when that's their God-given role. It might look like contributing wisdom and applied gospel thinking in a meeting or in a Bible study, but allowing the men in the church leadership to fulfill their role. Again, I've seen examples of this wonderfully in the congregation here. So those are some suggested outworkings of what it looks like. I'm nervous to be too prescriptive. It will look different in different marriages, in different settings. But it's about seeking, with God's help, to live out the principles. And I wonder if the key thing is not so much getting it exactly right, but seeking to do it. Because it reflects the remarkable God-given equality and difference between men and women in the church. It's full of honor. And that's where Paul goes next. Point three, reflecting our God-given equality and difference as men and women. Verse seven, Paul says, For a man ought not to cover his head, since he's the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That's why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now these verses are unpacking Genesis 2, which we had read to us earlier. And essentially they're saying, men, don't cover your head. Don't abdicate your responsibility in marriage or in the church because you're living out a calling that brings glory to your maker. Man is the image and glory of God. Then we also see woman is the glory of man. And do you notice what word is missing? You can do spot the difference. Well, it doesn't say woman is the image of man. And that is because woman, just like man, is made in the image of God. It's a quality and diversity rooted in creation. Genesis 1 says this, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, him, male and female, He created them. And that is where we see the foundation in the gospel, in the world, for equality and difference. Men and women having intrinsic, equal dignity and value because we're all made in the image of God. Our culture says you can't be different and equal. The gospel says have both, equality and difference. Made in the image of God, but with order. Verse 8, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Man is the image of glory of God. And when he honors his head in marriage and the church, the glory shines. And woman is the glory of man. And when she honors her head in marriage and the church, the glory shines. As men and women work together as God designed us to do. And so Paul says in verse 10, that's why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. 
displaying that attitude of honor in the church. But what have angels got to do with it? We could ask Robbie Williams, I'm loving angels instead. It seems like one of those phrases that you could use as a kind of answer to a question when you really haven't got a good reason. You know, why didn't you put the bins out last night? Uh, Because of the angels? (laughs) What is Paul saying? Well, back in chapter four, verse nine, he mentions them again, and they're witnesses to his ministry. Paul is a true servant-hearted gospel minister, and he's been watched by men and angels. And so I wonder if this just reminds us that the angels are watching, that they delight to see men and women honoring their God-given heads, participating in the life of the church, so that they flourish in the interdependent work of building up the church. And that's where Paul goes in his next point, interdependence. Verse 11, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. That phrase, in the Lord, well, it comes up at the end of the letter in chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And so Paul is saying, God's work in the church needs both men and women involved. Both should be involved in prayer and prophecy. Men don't abdicate, women don't usurp. Verse 11 could be translated more literally, woman is nothing apart from man, nor is man anything apart from woman. So any agenda that seeks to usurp the roles of men in marriage and church leadership well, it actually harms the church. It's a striking implication to ponder, isn't it? The rusty bike chain. But if men, if we think we could do it alone, Paul says, well, remember your mum. Remember the womb that bore you. bore you. You are not independent. The ministry of women in the church is essential. We work in interdependence according to the order that God has given, because all things are from God. A very brief line, but very powerful words. Who are we? Who we are? I mean, made, male or female. Well, it's a gift from God. To be called into his church is a gift of his grace. We are his, made by him, made for him, and that gives us humility to do things his way. And so as we close, Paul says, well, what do you think? Verse 13, judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Will you embrace this, says Paul. And he seems to try and answer his own question. Verse 14, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? But if woman has long hair, it's her glory, for her hair is given as a covering. It seems to be his final point of reasoning. And the language of nature here is speaking of the innate knowledge that we have that men and women are different. It's not that he's saying nature tells us exactly how, hair, how long hair should be. Everyone can grow long hair for a while. But there are men in the Bible with long hair, aren't there? Samson. The author Kevin DeYoung summarizes, well, summarizes this well, I think. Nature doesn't teach us how long hair should be. Culture teaches us the acceptable hair lengths for men and women. Nature teaches us that men ought to adorn themselves like men and women like women. So in our culture today, hair length is not tightly connected to being man or woman. And I don't think this passage puts any burden on us to have particular hair lengths. But the point is there, there is male and female and we know it. And however much culture around us at the moment might be trying to say otherwise, we know there is male and female. Nature tells us. You could just ask the person on the street. It's hardwired. I'm conscious that, as I say that, it may just be that there is someone here this morning who is distressed or confused about their gender. This passage is actually very good news for you. The gospel of Jesus frees you from the burden of looking within to try and find your identity and says your maker has given you your identity. 
He didn't make a mistake when he made you. You're made in his image, male or female, as you were born. He offers you liberation from the prospect that hormone therapy or surgery are your only hope. He holds out to you a true hope, inviting you to come to Jesus, who has done everything necessary so that you might flourish as the man or woman you have been made to be in this life and for eternity. And so for all of us, will we embrace God's order? This is the pattern for all the churches, God's church. Will we as a church keep prayerfully seeking to live this out so that we flourish in the interdependent work of building God's church? How we behave as church really matters because the church matters to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you speak to us and that you help us to know who we are. Please help us to understand your good creation order for men and women. May we embrace who we are as your gift to us and may we, in your church, be full of honour and unity, building one another up and honouring our head. Please guide us as we seek to do this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.